You're tuned into the Writing Community Chat Show, the live streaming YouTube podcast that brings you the stories of authors, screenwriters and more. Indie or established, this show's for the community and we invite you to be a part of it. Head to the writingcommunitychatshow.com for more info. The WCCS, together as one, we get it done. Hello and welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Writing Community Chat Show. We are flying through season 13 and we are coming up to the end of it. In a couple of shows it'll be uh, the end of season 13, knocking into season 14. We've had some great, great news and achievements on the show in the past week so we'll talk about that very shortly but before we get into that and talk about tonight's guest and speak to tonight's guest mr hooley is here and i'd like to speak to him too so how chris are you doing this week i'm very good thank you how are you yes i'm good i'm good um last week i realized my age when i i was literally getting washed i leant over the sink and my back went <laughs> like an old man <laughs> so i did my back in but uh, in a couple of days i was i was quite active and moving so it's it's pretty good at the moment so yeah with old age aside, not too bad. How about yourself? Yeah, I remember like literally the day after turning 30. So I'm 34 now, but the day after turning 30, my back went and I was like, oh, <laughs> this is a, a sign of things to come. <laughs> well, yeah, you wait till you get to 40, which is my new age. And uh, yeah, yeah, things, yeah, I mean, not too bad, but that that was quite an awakening. Um, yeah, so <laughs> as I mentioned, it's been quite a big week for us. We hit an amazing milestone on YouTube, which means we uh, officially became YouTube partners and means we've got adverts on our channel now, and which means a little bit of monetization can come back into the show, which is all good for covering the costs. Um, and also it means that things are, are rolling. And the music videos that we've been putting together for authors to kind of chill out to and write to, um, they've been absolutely flying. So <laughs> where we struggled for a while to get a couple of hundred watch hours, um the music videos have surpassed that with ease um so if only we thought about that a few months back but there you go we're there now uh, <laughs> thank you very much anna uh yeah chris any other news from you um no not really writing obviously i wrote my first poem today which was weird um yeah where, where did that come from well i bought a couple of poetry anthologies from various different poets and um i've been reading them this week so, something a bit different and I thought you know what I'm going to give it a go so so I did today and I've sent it to my um writing buddy Mr Ross mm -hmm. Young and uh, I'm sure I literally sent it just before the show so I don't know if he thinks it's absolute rubbish or he thinks I've got the makings of a poet but I'm sure I'll find out afterwards I, I mean, I mean the people in the chat if, can, can you give some persuasion to make Chris read this at the end of the show um, I'm not sure he would, but if he has oh. a few more drinks and you keep persuading him, it might happen. Yeah, I'll tell you what I will do. I'll read it in the after show because it's been four years. We're having an after show celebration of four years of the Writing Community Chat Show um, this week. So, yeah, that'll be good. So if there's enough demand for it, maybe I'll read it later on. Yeah, get in the chat, guys, and um, hound Chris Hooley with some encouragement, please. And uh, mm -hmm. again, to the chat, Anna's there, Linda. Thank you all so much for joining in live. And um, if you're new to the channel, hello and welcome. We are both Chris, very confusing. Um, I go by CJ just to make it easy, easier. Um, but please involve yourself in the chat. We've got a wonderful community that get in the chat and um, and talk a lot of craziness that distract us, to be quite honest. But we will have your questions for tonight's guest as well. Um, so send some questions throughout, but also remember, at the end of the show, you do have a section where we specifically get your questions. So don't feel pressured to get them in early, but you can do that as well. Um, so are you ready for the show, Chris? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to tonight's guest. She had a brilliant intro um, to the show in terms of she dropping little teasers. And who knew that she was a real life magician as well? Um, so yeah, know, yeah, first of, of, of her kind. Um, we've never had a magician on the show, but we're looking forward <laughs> to the chat to her. Um, yes, we have. Our second year birthday, we had a, a real life one. <laughs> he was a real life magician. However, um, Jennifer um, 
tonight's guest put a wicked video on the other day on Instagram. Um, and I, we've had some good introductions to the show, but I think that was absolutely fantastic. Um, so tonight's guest, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is not just an author or a magician uh, or an author extraordinaire, but author also a master of witty prose and the heart melting romance. From charming columns to captivating novels, she's here to sprinkle some literary magic and maybe she'll even dish out a few secrets about our latest releases. So get comfy and prepare for a ride filled with laughter, insights, and of course, plenty of bookish love. So please join me in welcoming one of uh, the one and only Jennifer Bardsley. Hello, Jennifer. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi, thank you for having me. I wish I really was a magician because then I could make laundry disappear, but I can only make it multiply. <laughs> yeah, I get that problem as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Great. Great. It's 1 p.m. where I live, which is in Seattle. Yeah, um, it's 8 p.m. for us. So we are on, on the more alcoholic beverages. On the sparkling uh, water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And I love your bookshelf in the background, by the way. Well, thank you. Yeah, certainly. Um, so, yeah, Seattle, I mean, I don't know much about places in America. We've got quite a bit of our audience from America, so they will inform me i'm sure but seattle how is that for kind of an author world uh do you meet people there do you go to conventions how is that in terms yeah, of being a writer have, um my the town where i live in i say seattle but really it's seattle adjacent i live in a town called edmonds and we have our own edmonds right on the sound writing convention and then there's some other big cons in our area like emerald city comic con is probably one of the biggest um, so this is a great place to read and write, and there's lots of arty people, lots of people who love to read. Yeah, so sounds great. Place. Lovely. And weather-wise, here in the UK, has gone from promising spring to back to winter all of a sudden. Yeah. How is it there with you? We have some sunshine at the moment, but la yesterday I was at a track meet, and it was what well, 40 degrees Fahrenheit and raining. I don't know what that <laughs> is. It was really, really cold. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we've got the cold right now. Um, so, Jennifer, as we do on the show, we have three sections uh, for you. So the first one is the road to writing. So I'm going to play a very quick video, and hopefully we'll get some really good insights and some tips. And by all means, if you've got stories to tell or, or going off on tangent, it is not a problem. So I'll play the video, and then we'll have a good look into your road to writing. <laughs> Hello to Halo, uh, just joined in the chat, and Anya as well. Thank you so much. Please get yourselves involved, as you always do. Uh, Jennifer, yes, uh, your road to writing. Can you remember a time where writing wasn't really a focus in your life, but that that light bulb moment happened and you suddenly thought, this is something I really want to get into? Yes. I was originally an elementary school teacher, and then uh, probably like it is in England, daycare costs are astronomically high here. Uh, and so teachers wages are usually pretty low. So when we, I had my son, I stayed at home and within me, I had my daughter. So I was a stay at home mom and I could not stop thinking about all the things I'd done as a kindergarten teacher. And that kind of translate in, into a blog called teaching my baby to read, which no longer exists. Uh, but I really did teach my toddlers how, how to read um, short words and stuff like that. And it was about reading books with children and basically celebrating things like that. And it was in the height of mommy blogdom. That's not really a thing anymore, but let's see, this must have been 14, 15 years ago. It was a thing. So I started the blog, loved writing, loved connecting with readers. And that gave me the courage to pitch a newspaper column to my local paper, which rejected me. <laughs> I was crushed. Uh, but then I sell, held on to the sample columns. And a month later, I submitted them to an even bigger newspaper in my regional area called the Daily Herald of Everett. And they said, this is exactly what we are looking for. And that became the I Break for Moms column that ran for 11 years. Wow. Uh, the Sunday paper. And so once I had the newspaper column, then then I, that gave me the confidence to think I've always wanted to write a book. Now that I have some sort of credentials behind me, like publishing credentials, maybe I could get an agent. 
And I had known about the process and had tinkered at it, but had never really fully committed. And once I was able to send out my query letter saying that I was also a newspaper columnist in addition to a blogger, that really helped. Uh, and so I got my agent, Liza Flessig of Liza Rice Agency in New York. And she's brilliant. I've been with her ever since. I think I just mispronounced her name because I was <laughs> <laughs> Eliza Rice Agency. She's wonderful. She's based in New York. Um, and that got my first uh, deal with a small publisher. And that was at the time um, when young adult fiction was so popular. Uh, there was The Hunger Games, Divergent, uh, uh, what's the vampire one? Uh, Twilight. Twilight, yeah. We're all like, that was when, that was the real scene as the way to make money was in YA. And so my first book was called Genesis Girl. It was YA. And then I did that for a while. Um, went from one publisher to another publisher. And then so finally switched over into what I really love writing, which is sweet romance or closed door romance and women's fiction. So I've been doing that yeah. since uh, 2021. Wow, that's an incredible journey. What's really interesting is how you utilized, uh, say, the, the column, column writing mm -hmm. to then back up your CV almost as a writer to, to pitch yourself. And I think that's a really interesting idea. And there's a lot of authors out there, new authors that maybe have written a book or two, and they're looking to get kind of published or struggling with that. So doing little competitions or putting yourselves in the papers might be a really good way to, to back that up. I think that's some really good advice. But also what I'm interested in is when you published it, uh, pitched it first time and the newspaper rejected it, where did the confidence come from then to suddenly go, actually, I've got the faith in this. I'm going to go to a bigger newspaper and then pitch it again. I don't know why. I think because I had already spent the time to write the four sample columns and I really didn't want them to go to waste. And I thought, well, I could always publish them on my blog if I want but why don't I just try? I'll just try it one more time. And luckily it all worked out. <laughs> but <laughs> I think a lot of auto writers can relate to that. You're like, should I? And I have in the middle of, in the middle of me writing YA, I forgot to mention this, in the middle of me writing YA and, and women's fiction, I self-published um, books under the pen name Louise Cypress. And that started to do so well that my agent sold two of my YA titles to a publisher that um, traditionally published it under Louise Cypress. Because at mm -hmm. that point, my self-published books were doing better than my traditionally published books. So mm -hmm. I've, 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 crossed, I've crossed everything. <laughs> I've done a lot of different things. It's really interesting to have your pen name doing well like that. But also... At what point did you suddenly think, do you know what, I'm going to stick to Jennifer or come back as Jennifer? Was there a reason for that? Yes, that's a great question. So so Louise Cypress was at one point kicking Jennifer Bardsley's butt <laughs> until, until she wasn't. And it was, I had written a, my, my series that did really well as Louise Cypress, I think I have, was Bite Me, which was paranormal vampire romance. And it did well enough that my agent was able to sell that series to an audiobook deal, which was my first audiobook deal, was for a self-published book. And I followed it up with a paranormal YA romance, but it was shifters instead of vampires. And I don't know if I got the cover wrong. I probably got the cover wrong. It just did not hit the market. Or maybe the shifter romance market isn't as large as the vampire romance, or I missed the trend. I don't know. That series tanked, just tanked. And that really took the wind out of uh, my sales writing as Louis Cypress. <laughs> and I kind of like took this career moment to reevaluate my life and what I was doing. And that's when my agent suggested switching to uh, Sweet Romance and Women's Fiction. Wow. Mm. Jennifer, I'm really intrigued in terms of, <clears throat> it seems that you've always had your finger sort of on the pulse you know, with the mum hitting the mummy blog stuff at the the right time, then as you've said with the YA stuff. But what like a lot of people would go, Oh, this is I know this is trending, I know this is a really good genre to be in at the minute, but they wouldn't necessarily have the confidence to maybe write a YA novel or to write a sweet romance novel. 
So how did you approach that? What was your sort of like tactics going into it? Uh, there is a program, I don't know if you've heard about it, called Kindle Rocket. Have you heard, has anyone ever mentioned Kindle Rocket? It rings a bell. It's a soft, I think it's called Kindle Ro Rocket or Kindle Spy, maybe. And it's a software program where you can type in any book or any genre and it pulls up instantly how many, how much money that title, that author, that keyword is making on Amazon each month. And so when I knew that I was going to switch to writing sweet ro or romance, originally it was romance. And I was like, I cannot write steamy romance. My mother-in-law is going to read this. It's going to have to be clean, right? Because that's just, I just can't deal with that. I'm a former kindergarten teacher, right? I can't. So my writer critique partner with me, Penelope Wright, who is absolutely brilliant. She's self-published and doing really great. Um, started on Bella, which I don't think you guys have access to in the UK, right? Bella, where you can write the short serials. She starts on serial serialization of her books, and then she makes money on that and then puts it on KDP and makes even more money. Um, but we were looking at Katie uh, at Kindle Rocket together, and we typed in small romance, and like that that lit up. And then we typed in um, single dad romance, and that typed up. And Penny goes, "Add a baby to it. Add a baby to it." So I'm like, single dad with a single dad. Small town, sweet romance, single dad with a baby. And it went boom, 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 boom. And so wow. that came me in that that was like, oh, there's a market for this type of book, which sounds kind of bizarre to me when I was first typing in the keywords. But that became um, Sweet Bliss, which has sold, which my agent sold to Montlake, which is owned by Amazon Publishing. And it sold over 50,000 copies by now. So it's incredible. Yeah. That question, Chris, on the right, um, which is uh, really about writing to market and analyzing what do people want to read? Because I think when I first started writing, I was like, what do I want to write? What's uh, what am I? What's the story I yearn to tell? And that yeah. is great when you're writing for the love of writing. But when you switch over to writing for money, then you you really want to analyze the market and what is selling right now, which is, I think, what my current publisher, Book of Tour, is really brilliant at. Like, you often see their books in the top 100 on Kindle in both Amazon America and Amazon UK, and it's because they're so good to zero mm. in on what is it that readers want to read? Let's give them more of that. Mm. How often do you think this trend can be kind of reacted to? Because Say, for example, someone now picks up this wonderful tool that you've mentioned. I think that's incredible for someone to now discover. Say they pick that up and they go and search keywords and suddenly they see the fireworks that you kind of described. And but they they can't write a book, say, for it takes them, say, 14 months to write a book. Yeah. Do you think that trend will still be kind of current at that point when the book is ready for release? That that's like the age old question between indie authors and traditionally published authors, right? Because agents at most traditional published houses are acquiring books that they're going to publish two to three years from now. So they're yeah. totally going to miss the trend. So at one point, YA dystopian was hot. Now it's not. Now it's all romanticy, right? From Fourth Wing, from Rebecca Yeros. And uh, people who are able to write books really fast and catch that and self-publish or go with a real um, innovative digital first publisher like Book of Tour is mm -hmm. um, can can capture that. But then other people you need to like, I guess, pick to the classics of uh, things that will never go out of style, like, you know, cozy mysteries. Those are probably never going to go on style. Or you can sometimes look at what is on TV right now. So science fiction has kind of not had um, a renaissance yet, but it could now that in America, that three body problem mm. on Netflix is so popular. That might mean that yeah. there's going to be a bunch of alien interest in alien books in the next year or so. I was literally thinking of that program as you said that. Um, I'm really enjoying that incredible series. And I think you're right. So, I mean, do you think a, a, a genre or a trend, say someone writes something in that in that trend and they miss the kind of the trend or the curve, do you think that would come back around at some stage? Is that worth holding on to, for example? I think 
if I had if I had written something and I kind of missed the trend, I would try to self publish it. Um, okay. Because you can still catch the kite wind. Like two or three years ago, the big um, genre in indie publishing for YA was the Academy books. Have you heard about this? No. It was like writing Paranormal Academy. Um, and I actually wrote one. I saw that that was like the trend. It was in my Louis Cypress days. And so I did a crossover between the Shifter and the YA book or the vampire books. And I kind of mixed them all to up and I called it um, Shifter, uh, Slayer Academy like that. And I put them both. And it was like getting 10,000 page reads a day as soon as I published it. It just went boom. And it brought mm. the, um, the Shifter series that had tanked. It brought them back up because it had some of the same characters. But now people mm. aren't reading, I don't think, paranormal YA Academy books like they were back in 2017 or 2018. Is. Then, it, then it became the next trend was uh, reverse harem books, which was not something I was going to write because, like I said, former kindergarten teacher. But that, that mm. had a huge movement in indie readership in, I think, around 2019 up until the pandemic hit. And I don't follow it as closely now, but I'm sure that um, romanticy is probably really like this ma this mix between magical fantasy and romance is is so hot right now. Ooh, it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, Chris, have you ever have you ever discovered something like that where you can search the kind of the current trends? No, I mean, I don't think I'm astute enough as a writer to be doing that. I think I've just been stuck in the write what you want to write mode. Um, but, so this is obviously really eye-opening for me because I'm like, oh, that's how you make money and that's how you make the success of it. Um, but yeah, I suppose having had experience of both sides, the self-publishing and the traditional publishing, what would you say the advantages and disadvantage are of both? Because we have a lot of people who watch this show that are probably at the point where they're deciding which road to go down. Uh, so what advice would you give to them, Jennifer? Uh, that's a great question. So I've been with four different publishers, and my past seven books have all been traditionally published with Montlake and then Book Tour. And the things I love about working with Montlake and Book Tour is the editorial has been amazing. I get a developmental or structural edit. In America, they call it a developmental edit. In London, they call it a structural edit. I didn't know this. Like, and then you get the line edit and the copy edit and the proofread and the cold read. I mean, it's so well edited. And, and <laughs> after all of that, they still find typos. But uh, <laughs> but <laughs> that is amazing. And the cover artists I've worked that have done my covers have just done such a great job. Usually um, the audio happens right away. I've had great actors who voice, I did one book that had a mom's group, a Facebook mom's group in it. And they had, they hired a different voice actor to, to portray all the different voices in the mom's group. And it was hilarious. So I really enjoy all of that. I love that. Um, and I love being paid on time. I love working with honest publishers. who are going to make sure you get your royalty statement and are, they're going to make mm. sure that you know how many books you're selling. That's really great. Not yeah. every publisher is like that. With some publishers, you don't know how many books you've sold until a year and a half later when you get your author statement. Wow. Or you might even question if that author statement is accurate. Or your author statement might show that you had a whole bunch of printed paperback returns. And now instead of earning out your advance, you're never going to earn out your advance because all these books were returned in the bookstore. And you're like, but wait, were my books even in the bookstore? I don't know. I just have to take it on faith. So there's there's some things that can happen um, in publishing, which is why the old advice, uh, no contract is better than a good, no, wait, no contract is better than a bad contract is really true. Mm -hmm. um, so careful with who you partner with uh, and yeah. make sure you have an agent like I do. Liza is, she's a former lawyer. She she is amazing. She goes over every contract to make sure that I'm always protected, no matter which publisher I work with. Um, but the good things about self-publishing is you have total control. You can write fa If you can write fast, you can catch those trends. You can make sure you have Facebook ads running for your book. You can make sure that the publisher is adequately 
marketing your book. You can, um, if something is wrong about the details page on Amazon, like if there's a typo in the synopsis, you can go fix it yourself without having to ask anyone. Uh, you can also have access to the KDP dashboard where you see how many books you're selling every single day. You can see if what the marketing, like if you did a show like this, did that then go ahead and sell books? You might not know that as a traditionally published author until you get your author statement a year and a half later, right? <laughs> Book of Tour, um, Book of Tour lets me know how many books I'm selling every single week, which is great. Mm -hmm. And Montlake, I have a dashboard because it's through Amazon, so they they tell me. But I've been with publishers where like I don't know how many books, I don't know how many books I sold. It's I just have to wait. Um, crazy, isn't it? Ooh. Yeah. I've got two, two questions for you off the back of that and to do with the finding an agent because you mentioned uh, not an agent a publishing house because you mentioned you had a couple of different ones so if someone is looking for the right one as you mentioned having kind of the wrong one might not be a great relationship so how what signs or what advice have you got for someone to find the right one and also if they are offered a contract an indie author for example are they is it wise for them to go and find advice on that contract? Yeah, that's, 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 those are good questions. Uh, there's still what we call in America vanity presses. I don't know if you call those that the same in England, but it's mm. um, back in the old days before self-publishing, you would pay someone to publish. And that still happens here in America. Only they don't call them vanity presses. Um, You'll get, if someone cold calls you and says, hey, guess what, Jennifer, I love your book. I want to publish it. Um, and you don't have an agent. You're just, you know, there and you with their mommy blog. That's probably, it, it could very well, could be true. But if they say, oh, and it's only going to cost you $10,000, scam. As soon as they ask you for money, that is a scam. Because the money should always flow from the publisher and the agent to the author or from the publisher to the author via the agent, not the other way around. You shouldn't have to pay an agent to represent you. You don't, and the same way you don't pay a publisher to publish you. If you do, that would be considered a vanity press. Um, what was yeah. your second question? I just, um, oh, and I have, I have, when I was, I always register the US copyright on my book, on my self-published books. And that must trigger something. Like it must get published somewhere because as soon as I do that, I always get, phone calls, literally phone calls from um, scam artists saying, hey, we found your book, blah, 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 blah. We'd like <laughs> to offer you a contract and it's only going to cost $5,000. And that is a scam. But if wow. you didn't do that, you might be really excited and, and get involved with something that was bad. So I you know, because yeah. for some people, that might be the first offer they've had and they'd be very excited. And, and yeah. I hope not, but some people might have parted with that money and mm -hmm. it's it's kind of scary, really. It is. Um, in have you heard of the American Gold Rush? Back, you know, in the oh well, like in the 1850s, 1860s, everyone was going to California to dig for gold. Like it was a big, and we always say the who made the most money in the gold rush, and it was the people selling the shovels. Yeah, it's the same way in uh, publishing. Oftentimes the people making the most money are not the authors or the writers, but it's the people selling you things like selling you a book marketing package, selling you an editing package, selling you this, making all these false promises that may or may not turn out. And it's the authors mm. who spend months and years working hard for that as well. Yep. Mm. I'm interested, Jennifer, you know, when you, obviously I know more about Book of Children than I do the American publishers, but do they, when they approach you, do they say, you know, we have this sort of projection for your career. We think that you'll sell this number of copies with us. You know, if you do come with us, we can push you in these markets and, you know, we can help you grow in this way. Do they really pitch to you a sort of an idea of where your career is going to go? And, and do they deliver on that? I know it sounds, you're probably not going to badmouth your publisher, but, you know, some publishers <laughs> might offer you the world and then, that doesn't transpire you know we've had people on the show before where they've had similar experiences where they've been offered really good stuff and then it's not transpired yeah that book of tour is really amazing i've been very happy with them so far and they had originally approached my agent um about another author who was not available at the time but my agent 
who's always looking out for me. She's like, you know who'd be great? A great book and tour author is Jennifer Marsley because she can write fast. Mm -hmm. And I can't, and a book of tour, that's not to say that all of the book of tour authors write fast. A lot of them will publish one book a year um, or less. They not, they, you can be any type of writing speed and be successful there. But uh, they wanted, were looking for a author who could write that sweet romance in a small town with a bit of mystery. And they were willing, wanting an author who was willing to do a quick release so my first two Sandeller Cove books came out. Um, the blue one is the first and the red one is the second. They came out on the same day. And then a month later, the third one came out. And so that that's called a quick release. And it's going for the um, readers who are going to binge read, especially on Kindle Unlimited. Um, like it's a Netflix show. They're just going to do, 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 do. But what that meant was I had to spend all of last year writing three books. It took me over a little bit of over a year and a half. And just wow. And it was intense. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. But yeah. uh, for someone who said that they write fast, I'm intri intrigued to know what that means because we've had people on the show that talk about writing two and a half thousand words a day. Some people write in 200 to 400 a day. So it really varies. So what's fast for you? How does that work? Yeah, well, I didn't always write fast. The first books I wrote took me, you know, a year, like a, uh, for many writers, that's standard. That, uh, but later on, once I learned to outline, once yeah. I changed from being a pantser to a plotter, then I really started to be able to to produce higher quality work for me. Now, I mean, there's lots of pantsers out there who nail it every time. Um, I did not. I had to do a lot of revision. Um, but once I started outlining things and I learned to once now at this point, I've written 20 books. So it does. It's still, it never gets easier. It's still really hard, but I know what I'm doing more. So I don't make as many mistakes that need to later be rewritten. Um, but I usually write when I'm writing a book, I, I try to shoot for 3000 words a day. I don't take any breaks, not even on the weekend. If I have to take, like if I have a whole bunch of kid things going on, um, I'll write 200 words just so I stay in the zone. Cause as soon as you take it, as soon as you take a break from your manuscript and the next time you come back, you're like, what, who's the character? Oh, <laughs> like, you lose the, um, and so doing it that way, I can finish a rough draft in about a month and a half. And then if it was well outlined, it doesn't need revisions that my earlier books did yeah it's and impressive. the other thing that helps me have you guys heard of a free write no a free write is um i have it over there but unfortunately it's, you can kind of see it's in the box it looks like an, an old-fashioned typewriter but it's not connected to the internet so you're there clicking away on your typewriter without being distracted by the internet at all and then you mm. just send button and it goes to your um, email so then you can wow. upload it and once I did that like if I'm on my computer I can only write 500 words an hour but if I'm on my free write I can write over a thousand words an hour so it really was amazing yeah and, and you can't edit very well on it but again that stops the self-editing that stops you from going back you just dump it all out <laughs> cool that's, that sounds really just cool out. yeah no I like yeah. that that's a good idea um, before we move on, uh, I know this is going to go quick and we're going to push time because you've got so much great content coming here that I think a lot of our viewers will really drink this in. Um, but before we do move on to the next part and talk about your latest books and what might be coming out, um, you mentioned a 20 book career so far, and I think that's quite incredible. So from your journey, which is obviously well learned and you, you progress every time, what one tip, maybe through your, your editors or your publishers, whatever, have you got that you've learned is the most valuable tip you can pass on right now? Ooh, uh, always start before you start writing a book. See if you can describe the whole book in one sentence. Uh, like a, like Sweet Bliss was a, a single dad with a baby moves to town and falls in love with an ice cream shop owner who steals his heart. It was something like that. Like if you have that one sentence description, um, then that helps shape everything else. 
yeah that's like book done for me <laughs> like the story's there <laughs> a one page novel um amazing that's a great uh, great tip thank you um Chris, anything else on the, on? I mean, Jennifer, we have we've hardly touched on your career, but there's been so much great content there. But we do have to push on to part two. But do you want to ask anything else, Chris, before we move on? No, I just saw that um, that one sentence as a sort of crime head on that the baby wasn't his. He just moved to town with a baby. Ooh, uh, Ooh that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I like that. Um, but yeah, it's a great tip. You know, can you summarize your book? And I think if people go. Oh, that's a really good idea. Or, or I'd read that. That you're onto a winner. So yeah, great advice. It is great advice. And if you're watching this right now and you've got a book or you've got an idea, one sentence challenge. Put that in the chat, and we'll have a look at those and review them possibly in a couple of minutes. So put those in the chat for us. And this is part two. What's the story coming right up? So, Jennifer, I noticed when you showed your books, the third one was not the one I've got up in the top corner, which is photographs That's from the cove. Um, so would you like to pitch us your latest book? And then we'll get into that a little bit. Well, Book of Tour really wants me to push them as a series, although they're they're all different ones. So I'll start with the series, which is about two sisters who have escaped tragedy twice to become grown women who stick together no matter what. And... They have their grandmother, they have each other, they have the beauty of this gorgeous little beachside town called Sand Dollar Cove on the Washington coast. And the series has mystery, romance, uh, handsome strangers who move to town and multi-generational uh, humor, which I love including, because I know that so many of my readers um, go all the way from like their twenties up until their eighties. So I try to make sure that there's something there for everyone. Uh, but the latest one, which is Notes from the Cove, which came out last week, um, is very special to me because out of all the books I've written, this is the first one that has ever had a main character who's the same age as me, which is 45. And usually that's because it's hard to get um, romance books published that don't have like a 20 or maybe even a 31, like even 35 is kind of pushing it. Publishers usually like look for, or acquisition editors usually want younger leads. Um, but this one is about a woman whose son has just moved off to college like me, and she has to start her life over. In my case, I'm happily married for 23 years, but in Brittany's case, she falls in love with her <laughs> brother's best friend who moves back to town. So <laughs> it's, it's, it was a fun book to write from that. And also I got to do all of like the Generation X um, stuff like with the music choices that she listens to and then her interaction with her teenage son, which was just, I loved writing all that because it hit so close to home. Yeah, it sounds a lot of fun. Uh, do you think kind of that reaction from having readers of kind of all varied ages is because of the way you set your characters up from having young characters, middle-aged characters and older characters within that family kind of connection? Do you think that's why you've got that interest? I think it's a chicken and egg situation because I always had that in my books to begin with because uh, my grandparents have always been important characters, even in my YA books. Uh, but then once I started writing for Montlake, so I had four books with Montlake that started off with Sweet Bliss, um, my Kindle Unlimited readership went up and up and up. And... I, there's a lot of baby boomers, you know, they're retired, they have more time to read, they'll have a Kindle, like they might be in a, um, there's the cost of living crisis. So they're, they're often like saving money by having a Kindle limited subscription instead of buying a whole bunch of individual books. Yeah. So there's a lot of baby boomer. I don't know if you, do you use that word in England? Like this? Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. use, they, there's a lot of older readers who are reading on Kindle Unlimited. And so once I realized that, I'm like, oh, I should always have like this side plot that's a baby boomer love story as like the B plot in my book. So there's something for everyone. And uh, in the Sand Dollar Cove series, there's uh, the, the grand goes to the senior center. And so then I have all these fun senior characters who they're like, they have their own romance in, um, Talk of the Town, which came out from Montlake last year, that was the one that uh, was about the Facebook moms group that sets 
uh, as a widowed mom and a real estate agent up together. But that had this character called the, the Silver Fox, who was working <laughs> through all of the water aerobics ladies at the local YMCA. <laughs> wow. Nice. Yeah, it sounds amazing. Um, Halo said in the chat, she just read two romance novels with the main characters in their 40s and loved that different age range. Yeah. So it is interesting, especially if you think it's the publishers who kind of push that younger age range when clearly there's a market for that older gap. Yeah, and Book of Tour did not tell me no. Like, no one from Ooh. London said, don't do this. They're like, yes, we love this idea. Go for it. But I think that also shows how innovative they are and how they understand what readers want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and Linda agrees as well, sorry, Chris. Uh, older leads uh, is kind of refreshing. So I think, I think, yeah, I think people are noticing that 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 is a refreshing kind of thing. And it's not all the same in, in that sense. And the characters are very diverse. In, and I think... It sounded like a lot of fun for me writing it as well as people reading that. So, mm. my question, Jennifer, was going to it's going to annoy some people that watch the show and that have been in the after show. But one of my favorite portrayals of love was La La Land. <laughs> I'd like to know what love is to you and how you go about portraying it in your books. Hmm, that's a great question. And La La Land is an interesting amp answer because I would say the definition of a romance is there has to be some sort of happy ending. And that was not <laughs> necessarily happy ending. But I think um, I always like honesty and truth and protection, I think, are such. So a lot of the, the romance characters in my books, um, they're, they're, they're always going to be safe with that person. And that person is always going to be looking out and protecting them kind of like uh i always love this song i would walk ten thousand miles that is like <laughs> one of my favorite songs and like basically that could describe that could be the song of every single romance couple in my book <laughs> <laughs> need some good shoes for that um yeah. the, pro the proclaimers i love that song uh but yeah i i think that's a great answer i mean yeah uh safety um compassion care all of those things but how do you write a good character with those traits oh that's a great uh, i usually before i start plotting my book i make a list of 10 reasons why the main character and the romance partner are perfect for each other like why, while they're meant for each other and whenever i forget to do that then i run into trouble because there's like no chemistry between the characters and i think oh duh i didn't write my list and once you write the list, then it makes it so much easier because you can just see how they dovetail together. Oh, nice. Mm. That's really and interesting. Jennifer, with, with sweet romance and closed door romance, we we know, like we've done our own research in the past in terms of like what sells and like we know that sex does sell to a certain mm -hmm. extent. So when you're actively choosing to exclude that from the genre, what is it that, makes your books what they are and that people keep coming back to them for with the sweet romance and the closed door elements. You're right that steamy, there's a larger market for steamy romance. So if you're writing to market and you're like going for the biggest market share, it would be better to write steamy. Um, but since I can't, you also have to think about what's in your wheelhouse. And since that's not <laughs> in my wheelhouse, I right sweet but then that that own market there's a category on amazon called clean and wholesome romance and if you can get you know when when your book is rising up in the chart like right now i think they have me in sisters fiction or divorce fiction or um literary fiction or literary romance but um i've had books that were in the clean and wholesome romance category that's how um sweet bliss started up and there's readers who are actively looking for that. That is what they want to read. They don't want to read something that's steamy. They don't, they're just looking for that. And that might be also be why I have uh, a wider, I mean, I don't think there's an age limit on that either. Uh, so that comes down to the right to market part. So they're like identifying that that is its own market. It might not be as large of a market as steamy romance, but there is that clean and wholesome market out there. Mm. But how, how do you write to that? What would your advice be? What would your tips be? If you had three tips to give to somebody, what, oh, what would for, you think? For a, clean, for, for a clean book, you have to be really careful about swear words. Um, I have 
a couple of judiciously placed swear words, but I'll get marked down by people who um, it's like, oh my gosh, you said hell. That that will mark that will mark it off. There's that. There's no f bombs, even though like I might have really I use those in real life. Don't use them in my books because I'm trying to hit that market. So you have to have, and mm. I, I usually keep religion completely out of it because that can go all sorts of sideways. Like there's all sorts of religious clean and holds some readers reading it, but there's also secular. They just don't want to read that. They they might be atheists, but they don't want to read that. Um, the the steamy scenes either. So you have to you have to think about that. Think about what your reader wants. Um, so yeah, I would I would say think about what your reader wants and avoid those things like no sex, oh no drugs. Like there there could be drugs like off, but you're never going to see a clean and wholesome romance character get, get totally wasted. That would not be part of the. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Before we move on to part three, because as I mentioned, time's flying because you are giving so much great advice. Um, what's next in the series or is the series done? What's next for the, what can people expect? Man, I wish I had the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I have a um, fourth book uh, outlined for it. And then I have a whole different series outlined, but I'm just kind of like waiting to see what book a tour wants for me next or how the, and that probably depends on how books do. It's, that's like the, it's like kind of like being a real estate agent. Like you never know how much money you're going to make until you get the next house. I don't know. You sell the next house. I don't know. Um, I'm in that kind of like, I haven't signed a new contract yet. I don't know if one will be authored to me. I hope one will be because I love working with book a tour, but I'm in La La Land right now. <laughs> <laughs> before before we do move on, um, being in La La Land, without influence from Chris, what do you think about that film? Oh, what? Oh, well, at the moment, I'm really annoyed by it because my daughter has been playing that tune on the piano over and over again. And now it's going to be spring break. So there's going to be no stop. <laughs> would, you say it's it. would you say it's good or bad? I liked it. I liked okay. it. You're in Chris's camp. Um, yeah. One of few. Yeah. One of few people in that camp. I'm staying uh, quiet on this because I could just <laughs> run and take over the rest of the show. So I'll stay. stay yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going into part three of the show, which is the final 15 minutes or so, where we get to ask Jennifer our random stable questions. But you also get to ask Jennifer your questions as well. Or if you want to ask us something, you can. Um, but Jennifer mainly. So if you want to send some questions in, now is the time to do it. Just put them in the chat, press enter, and we will look at those and put them up on the screen. So community questions, part three, coming right up. Chris, you'd love to start this off, so please do so. Yeah, so the first of our staple questions is, if you could take any character from fiction and make that character your own, which character would you choose and why? I love Anna Green Gables. I have loved Ellen Montgomery books ever since I was little, and I think the character of Anne is just so incorrigible, and I love how she's so witty and thoughtful. I would I would love love to have an Anne of and character in my books. Nice. I mean, that was a very determined response. Normally we get a bit of hesitation. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, okay. If you could take the ending of anything, um, and that could be a book, a TV show, or a film, and change the ending, what ending are you going to change and why? Okay. Well, it, it's we have we we still there's still hope, but the ending of Game of Thrones, the way HBO did it, because I read the books, and of course the last book isn't out yet. But I don't think they they did right by Jon Snow, like him going no. out in the in the to the by himself, like into the wild. He should have gotten something better than that. I don't know if you guys agree, but yeah, I mean it's it's a very big, uh, a very well discussed topic on this show, and but what. What do you think you you said there's still hope? I'm very curious about how you mean about that. Well, how much did HBO really take what 
George R. R. Martin was going to do. Like we know, we still don't know how he's going to end it, right? Okay. Maybe. So he's the book. Mm. I'm so. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it, the the books are not going to go down the same route as the series anyway. So yeah, it's definitely going to be a curveball. Could be. Mm. There, there'll be a film adaptation or something. You know, it's it's too big of a gold mine not to go back. It's like Star Wars and all these other sort of, you know, Harry Potter, anything that makes a significant amount of money, they will revisit. Um, and I think the, the logical sort of choice would be, let's make some films, you know, someone like Netflix or Amazon putting a lot of money behind it and then going, let's stay a bit truer to the books and let's give people what, what they want. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that might happen. Cool. Yeah. Um, go, Chris. Yeah. The next next staple question um, that we have is kind of a new one for this series. But if you were going to send one of your books into space, and you knew that some far off species, alien race, or whatever, was going to read it, which book would you choose, and why? I think for that one, I would do Talk of the Town again, which came out last year, because because the, it has the social media in it. Each chapter is bookend by this hilarious Facebook moms group, and throughout the course of the book, you really get a look at what like small town drama is like via the Facebook group. There's like the, you know, the annoying the person who knows everything. Then there's like the, it's, it's every single person you've ever met in a Facebook neighborhood group is in this book. So I think that will give them a good reflection of what Americans are like, at least. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Um, before we go on to some questions coming in, um, I'll go with this one, Chris, because I know you like to, but I'm nicking it. Uh, you are on your deathbed in many, many years from now, looking back on your career. What would success look like to you? I hope I still have a, you know, a great relationship with my children and my grandchildren and I hope I'm not a burden to them, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a, a success question, but I just hope things are still, everything is still really happy with my family because that's what's the most important thing. Doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter how many books you sell or how successful you are if you don't have a good relationship with your children. So that's what mm. I would say. That is a brilliant answer. On that, Jennifer, we go to, we have another question and we're very much aware that we're on YouTube and um, this recording will probably outlive all of us. <laughs> Somebody is about to take your collection of work and they've said, right, we want more Jennifer Bardsley books. So you're entrusted with her collection. We want you to take her characters and do something with it. What advice are you giving to that person knowing that maybe 100, 200 years from now, they're watching this going, right, let's see what Jennifer says. What advice are you giving them? So you mean like if they're going to turn one of my books into a TV series or something? They are going to work with your characters. They're going to create new books. They might create a couple of TV shows. They're going to wholeheartedly live in the world that you're currently. Oh, well, for, for that, the, the Sand Dollar Cove series that just came out from Boca Tour would be great because there's so many characters in it. Uh, and it has, I think, capturing the, the small town fun and and antics and all the quirky characters that populate uh sand Other cove uh would be really fun because you could have such a diverse cast and making sure you got the location right because uh washington state beaches are beautiful but they're not california or florida beaches they are cold they are rocky <laughs> they're windy uh they're full of drama just like the, the environment is really important nice so. Awesome. And get the locations right, people. Yes. Yeah, you. definitely do that, yeah. Um, okay, Halo says, thank you for your question, which of your characters are you proudest, most proudest of creating? Oh, that is a wonderful question. Um, I really love the character. I haven't talked about it at all, but I wrote this book called The History of Us that's about... Uh, two former high school sweethearts who team up to solve a crime. And the crime is that the these coins, gold coins were stolen and they're important because they're the only thing that her father, Tom, can remember to talk about because he has Alzheimer's. Oh, wow. 
and my my grandmother and a lot of my great aunts and uncles all had Alzheimer's. So I'm really proud of the opening chapter of this book, especially because it takes place in the memory care center. Um, and I feel like I got that right. Like I was able to take all the time I'd spent with my grandma in the memory center and share that in the character of Tom and share what it was like to, to live with Alzheimer's and to care for someone with Alzheimer's. So that's what I'm most proud of. Wow. That's a great answer. Uh, thanks for your question, Halo. Oh, she got one more. We'll put that up as well. If Game of Thrones was a clean romance, <laughs> which characters would you use and how? The dragons. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, what, I, love why not? The, I love the character of Cersei because she's like an evil mom, but she loves her character. She loves her children. Like the redeeming thing about her is that... Um, Cersei, right? Did I say that right? Now it's been yeah. so long. Because mm -hmm. she, she's a good mother. Like you, you can say all sorts of horrible things about her, but she's a good mother, which makes her a really great villain. So I love, I love, I mean, oh, you'd have to take out the incest. That part is like not yeah. Yeah. Really, but... Not ideal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cersei is epic, uh, Halo yeah. said as well. So yeah. Yes. She loved your last answer, said it's such a beautiful answer, which it was. And Cersei is epic. Uh, thank you. Uh, Anya says, do you think Outlander is so popular because the characters are more mature in the later books? That could be, that could definitely be it. I think it's also America is fascinated with Scotland. Like there's, uh, there's definitely that. Whereas I, I was actually, I was just talking about this with another book of tour author about how Americans don't necessarily know where Cornwall is. So yeah. Cornish romance is like a huge thing, but not necessarily for Americans in the same way that Scottish romance is. So I think it's, I think that's the the right to market with the Highlander. Like that's just that there's something about that, that appeals to, to, to readers in a right to market type of way. But yes, I love all the, the generation spanning. And then you also get the, the world war two bits in it and everything. Yeah. Yeah. You can get some warmer romance in Cornwall, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, cold in Scotland, generally. Uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Sounds like you're talking from experience there, Agat. Yeah. Uh, Linda says... Warm romance in Cornwall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been to St. Ives a few times, anniversaries, all that. Um, Linda says, who are your favourite... Who are your favourite hero, heroine combo in fiction and why? Oh, well, I don't want to be super lame and say Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennett, but like it's hard, <laughs> it's hard not to, it's hard not to ship them. Um, I, yeah, I guess Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennett, I love them. <laughs> nice. I like what it. is it that you love about them? Because Darcy does get a lot of stick. I think because this, I mean, at its heart, that's an enemies to lovers romance, and I love enemies to lovers romances. It's a great trope. Um, but I've like heard, you know, you can look at even things like in the American, um, Disney movie, Beauty and the Beast. That's another great enemies to lovers. Like there's a lot of parallels between Beauty and the Beast and, um, Pride and Prejudice. Once you, once you start to like analyze it and draw little arrows. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That, yeah. Yeah. That's blown my mind to be honest. I've never considered that, but as soon as you said it, I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. We are. We've got like a minute left. So what I'll do, I'll ask you, Jennifer. All the people that are watching this, and I know there's going to be a lot of advice taken from this show. You've you've given fantastic tips and advice throughout this. But where can they find this fantastic series? Where can they find all of your books? Information about you, and where can they follow you on social media? Thank you. Uh, well, all my books are available on Amazon. Uh, you can look for Jennifer Bardsley, or uh, if you love YA paranormal romance, you can look for Louise Cypress. But um, I'm most active on Facebook uh, and Instagram. I have an Instagram account, so you look for Jennifer Bardsley author. Uh, in my Facebook reader group, Jennifer Bardsley's Book Sneakers, I give away free books every Friday. Unfortunately, that only works in America because they have these Kindle codes that I usually give away and it only works in America, which is unfortunate. Um, but I'm also on Twitter, not so much on Twitter because or X or whatever it's called now. <laughs> yeah. um, but 
And, and then my website, jenniferbirdsley.com. Yes. We will leave as much of that information link wise in the description. So please do check that out if you want to, if you want to see it. And uh, Jennifer also does great magician uh, edits as well. Uh, if you haven't seen that, check out her Instagram. We did tweet that as well, so, or X'd it. I don't know where we're going with this anymore. Um, but yeah, uh, amazing edit that was. And thank you for doing that. So Chris, before we wrap up any more questions from you. I was just going to say, um, to, uh, sort of a twofold question. If people are going to pick up one of your books today, which one should they start with? And also, can you recommend another author that you think people should know about and read? That is a great question. Um, I would say Postcards in the Cove, which is the first Sand Dollar Cove book. There's also a free short story that you could get for free that's pinned to the top of my Twitter feed that Book Tour and I worked on that kicks it off. So if you just wanted to read a little short story from Sand Dollar Cove and see if you liked it. Uh, what was the second question? Just to, is there an author that you think people oh. should know more about and would you recommend to read? Yes, um, I love Kennedy Care is a, another book tour author who writes similar uh, like small town romance with women's fiction and family mystery. It's set in a beautiful countryside. Um, uh, that's on the book tour end. On the Montlake end, Carolyn Brown writes beautiful small town romance set in the American West. And I love her book. She's also a clean and wholesome author. Um, and with lots of multi-generational characters like mine. Brilliant. Sounds fantastic. Amazing. Just before we finish up, Chris, I've got a really terrible joke for you. Um, why was the book at the construction site? I don't know, Chris. Why was the book <laughs> at the construction site? It was site? trying to build a stronger plot. Uh <laughs> This is my terrible joke for you. Um, okay, uh, Jennifer, you've been absolutely brilliant and I've loved this interview. It's been a great conversation and so many tips to come from this. Thank you so, so much from us. Um, you know, hopefully you get that next deal with Booker Uh They are great and I know you clearly fit in there and your sales do well. So I'm sure you will and all the best for the future. So thank you from us. Um, we've loved chatting to you. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. So everybody, uh, if you're on Patreon and you're joining our after show to celebrate four years of the Writing Community Chat Show and uh, YouTube partnership and all that great stuff, um, please join us. We'll send the links out in about five minutes. And if you're not um, and you want to join, you can do links in the description. But more importantly, have a great weekend. Have a very safe weekend and enjoy yourselves with friends and family. And we'll see you all again next week for another show. So from us, it's goodbye and thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody.